So I come from Netflix, and as many of you probably know, uh, we offer streaming service for our members to enjoy streaming content on demand. And as of today, we are available in almost all the countries in the world, except for China and North Korea. And we have about 150 million uh, members. So you have to understand that these are accounts, and every account typically have a couple profiles. So really, the scale is massive for us, and it gives us enough opportunities to try various sophisticated models, but it also gives us enough challenges, as we will be talking about in the next couple slides. Um, so as a uh, machine learning group um, and working on recommendations, we firmly believe that uh, recommendations are really means to an end. So our primary goal really is to maximize our members' enjoyment of the selected show, uh, while minimize the time it takes for them to find the show. And the only way to achieve these goals is to personalize. So at Netflix, almost everything is recommendation. We value personalization quite a lot, so much so that almost every aspect of our product is um, personalized for our members. So for example, uh, the ordering of TVs and movies in the rows that you see is personalized for you. The construction of the homepage, that is, the selection of the rows that you see in your homepage is personalized for you. And very recently, we also started personalizing the images that go along with the shows that are typically recommended to our members. And whenever we have new catalog, uh, new uh, TVs and movie shows in our catalog, we send out personalized messages to our members. So even this aspect of our product is personalized. Uh, so the real problem is that when you have thousands and thousands of items in your catalog, and a very uh, finite real estate, how do you show everything in front of our members? So it's really impractical to show everything. So you have to um, select handful of content which um, uh, appeals to our members and present them in front of uh, the members. So we personalize our recommendations. And in this talk, the uh, question is, how do we do it? And I try to uh, answer that in the next couple of slides. So uh, before I jump into the models and talk about how we build them, let me give you a very basic intuition behind what is called as collaborative filtering. So imagine you walked into a room full of movie enthusiasts from all over the world, from all walks of life, and your goal was to come out with one good movie recommendation. Would you obtain a popular vote? Probably not, because we are all you know, iconoclasts. We have our own unique taste. So let's now consider forming a group of people with similar taste based on the videos that they have previously watched. So for example, you may find a group of people who are into kids. So maybe it's a kids cluster. Uh, maybe you will find a group of people who love anything and everything about Star Trek. Or you may find a group of people who go crazy when they see dances and songs in Bollywood movies. So now, once you have established and formed these clusters, the idea really is to describe yourself using what you have watched and associate yourself with these groups and obtain what we call as personalized popularity vote. So this really is the intuition behind almost every model that we build, be it basic or be it sophisticated. The only difference is in the modeling capacity. So the basic models, such as matrix factorization or topic models that we'll be discussing, have some basic assumptions about how to form these clusters, how to form the propensity function so that you can tell which video is relevant to our member. And more sophisticated models, such as deep learning, which, which we will be talking about as well, have some more advanced assumptions about how the data is structured. So a um, couple years back, in order to build these collaborative filtering models, we started investigating into topic models. And these are extremely powerful generative models. Uh, and they have a certain generative story behind how the data is obtained. So the data that we are talking about is the videos that our members have watched, um, the time of the day when they watch, the day of the week, the device, the languages, the country, so on and so forth. So that's the observation. And then we want to build a collaborative filtering model, which is going to explain the observations. So uh, this is a very standard architecture where you say, um, let me see if I'm able to get the pointer. Um, never mind. So let's say you know uh, a user is in the mood of watching something, and uh, he has a couple of tastes. And taste, uh, for example, could be, say, comedy or horror, or things like that. So he has a distribution over the taste, and he may have you know, more bias towards comedy, less bias towards horror, and something like that. 
condition on that, the user selects a taste, condition on the taste, the user selects a movie, and then the user watches the movie. Uh, so we had that model, and uh, it worked great, but then Netflix went global. So we wanted to then make this model uh, work globally so that uh, you know, no matter where the user is from, the model uh, outputs relevant recommendations for our members. The problem came when we just pooled the data together and built one single topic model for the members across the globe. And uh, the problem came because uh, when we started uh, to look at the topics that were uh, being learned from the topic model, we realized that these topics were basically just learning the catalog differences. To give you an example, let's say we have two countries, country A on the left and country B on the right. And let's say country B doesn't have those two videos on the right, so Property Brothers and Friends. So when we build, when we pool the data together from all the countries and build one single model, we realized that the topics were really explaining the catalog differences. So we were wasting model parameters in learning something that we already knew a priori. So then we took this classical graphical model and extended it with some kind of a sensor pattern to tell the model which videos are available in which country and so on and so forth. Uh, then we also wanted to make this model dynamic so that uh, if the user is watching on a weekend, the model should understand that you know, the taste differences change depending upon the time of the day and the day of the week. So we started to add some extra random variables denoted here by M. Very soon, we realized that the model at hand is becoming very complex in terms of mathematical complexities. These models are notorious for inferences because you have to have some kind of a variational inference scheme or GIF sampling. And we realized that with every new extra random variable that we were adding, the math was becoming extremely complex. So it became impractical to scale. Um, and we soon realized that we need a better alternative so that going forward, when we have extra dimensions in our model to capture more context, things become manageable and scalable. Then came deep learning in 2016. So in my opinion, the largest gift that the deep learning revolution has given to us is automatic differentiation. So back in the day when we were working with topic models, the derivatives that we were computing of the laws with respect to parameters were done manually. So they were time consuming and they were poor to scale. As against that, with the toolkits that we have, the deep learning such as Flow and uh, PyTorch and Keras, they have automatic differentiation built in, which meant that the derivatives and the gradients that we were computing were time efficient and they uh, were excellent for scaling. So then uh, we decided to move on to the nonlinear world, but still work with generative models. And, uh, this is something that came out of our group. Uh, we call it variational autoencoder. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, generative model, and it basically, you can think of it as a nonlinear LDA, if you will. So this model uh, also has some kind of a generative story, uh, and it tries to explain the data that you see in your observation. So um, let's say you have a user denoted by u here, and he has some taste representation denoted by z sub u. Condition on that taste, you observe the observations, like the movies that the user has watched um, uh, at a particular time, on a particular device, in a specific country, so on and so forth. And uh, this z sub u is obtained using some posterior distribution. Let's denote that by p here. And then uh, u, which are the observations, are obtained using a multinomial distribution. And let's have some parameters f sub theta. Um, it's known that the posterior, true posterior distribution P is intractable, so let's approximate that by Q sub psi. And your Q sub psi is assumed to be normal, having some parameters mu and sigma, so let's you know, add that in the graph as well. Mu and sigma, in turn, are made as a function of U, which is our observations, and you have some other uh, approximations to tell what other functions can approximate the generation of mu and sigma condition on U. So let's denote that by F sub psi. Now you may wonder um, uh, what is really happening here. So we started with u, and then we obtained z sub u, which is the latent representation of our member. And then given z sub u, we obtained back uh, the observations that we have. So we are reconstructing it back. So we have this beautiful encoder-decoder architecture here. And the fact that we are employing some kind of a variational inference scheme to come up with q sub psi, the name of the model becomes variational autoencoder. Now you may wonder, what are these f sub size and f sub thetas? Well, they are nothing but our deep neural networks. 
And you can then imagine some kind of beautiful layers on top of these deterministic as well as stochastic nodes. So the generalization of LDA can be thought of as variational autoencoder. And the linear variant of variational autoencoder can be thought of as LDA. So this was beautiful, because now we could work with rich toolkits such as TensorFlows and Keras and PyTorch and work with very sophisticated, high capacity nonlinear models such as variational autoencoders and still try to build the collaborative filtering based models relying on the assumptions of the generative model that we uh, discussed previously. Uh, now, how do you do uh, contextual modeling in, uh, uh, in variational autoencoders or any neural network for that matter? So as against LDA, where uh, for every new context, we were introducing an additional random variable, and then we have to take care of the Gibbs sampling and variational inference and, and whatever mathematical complexities that came with it. In neural network, on the other hand, it's quite straightforward. So if you want to encode country as a context, then all we really have to do is to have country feature either concatenated in the input layer or some kind of a latent cross closer to the softmax. Now, um, we want our model not to spend its energy in understanding the catalog differences from one country to another. So in order for us to do that, what we really do is just create some kind of a censored mask. So in this example, we have property brothers not available in the country denoted by the color yellow here. So all we really have to do is to mask out that node in the output layer, which means all the connections going from that node are censored out. So the back propagation doesn't happen. So the model really doesn't care about updating any of the parameters that are connected to the catalog, which is not available in that country. So from country yellow here to, let's say, green, and if we don't have friends in that country, you follow the same procedure, and you just censor out the, um, uh, the titles that are not available in that country, so on and so forth. Now, if you want to add time to make the models temporal, even that is easy. All you really have to do is to append time features, which uh, could mean time at serving, either in the input layer or, again, as some kind of a latent cross uh, closer to the softmax. Uh, the problem is that these models are high capacity models, and they are trained on millions and millions of profiles. So they take time to train, sometimes a day, sometimes three days, depending upon how big the model is, how big the data set is. So then what happens is that the catalog that our, um, our service is getting is changing quite fast. So you can imagine on Fridays and on Saturdays, Netflix is releasing tons of new content. But if our model is not able to catch up with the new content, then the then the model won't be able to estimate the probability on every new show that has come into a service. So as a concrete example, let's say I have a deep learning model on the left, and the model has a vocabulary of all the titles that you see on top. And it doesn't know uh, anything about the new title, which is shadow in this case. So when you want to get the probability, because you want to do ranking in the end, if you want to get probability on the title shadow conditioned on everything that you know of the user, the context, the country, the time, everything, you can't estimate that because the deep learning model on the left doesn't have that video in its vocabulary. So you need to do something about it. Unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, these models are quite expensive to train. So if the cadence with which the catalog is changing is fast and, it's, and the model training can't uh, keep up with it, then you have to somehow amend the training strategy. And that's exactly what we do. Uh, so we uh, go for incrementally training our deep learning models. So imagine uh, you have a very big uh, model train on the data that you had on a particular time, and let it take whatever time it took to train. So let's denote that by the model that you see on the left side of the vertical line, and let's call it the warm start model. So assume that um, you have uh, some new videos that are coming into your service. Then all you really have to do is to extend the graph to encode for the additional nodes and the parameters. So the nodes here really are the identity of the videos that have come into your service. And the parameters are all the connections that go into that node. So you have a very big, good, warm start model. And then you have um, brand new parameters associated with the new items that you have uh, in your service. So then the idea is that you take the warm start model and do just incremental training or fine tuning, if you will, on these additional parameters and additional nodes. So then the recipe is quite simple. You take your deep learning model or whatever that is, 
and you censor out depending upon what is available in your country. You do um, context modeling by encoding the country, the time of day, the device, the day of the week, or whatever is uh, interesting to you at that point. And then every few days, you train your warm start model. And then every few hours, depending upon whichever warm start model is available at that point, you take the model, the warm start model, add new embeddings, and these embeddings could correspond to the new titles that have launched into the service, and initially they will be all random. And then you add new parameters, so for example, the new connections that go to the softmax layer, and anything else that are in the input layer corresponding to the new entries that you have added, and then you fine tune. So um, this was extremely important for us because our algorithms today are dynamic, global, and they uh, help local stories be heard globally. So when we were working with some of the graphical models, it became challenging for us to scale these models and make them fully contextual. But going past that and employing some of the uh, uh, deep learning models and employing some of the strategies that I discussed, we were able to get past that hurdle and build really global models that are aware of the local tastes. Uh, so the global algorithms that we ended up building started to foster global communities. As we all know, Narcos uh, became a worldwide phenomena. And uh, people across the globe who loved Narcos had a common theme. And the theme was that they were into you know, drug dealing, underworld kind of a genre. So, <laughs> so people in India who loved Narcos also loved sacred games because Sacred Games also has a very similar theme. Um, people in Korea who have similar taste also watched Drug, uh, The Drug King. And then people in the United States who loved Narcos also loved Ozark. Similarly, El Chapo in Mexico, the Mafia Dolls, and the Gomorra in Italy, so on and so forth. So by making the models local taste aware, yet global and temporal uh, and dynamic in terms of the catalog changes uh, made the algorithms you know, cross the, uh, the boundaries. So our title started to cross the boundaries, travel internationally, and our global algorithms started to foster global communities. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention.